Hello and welcome to a special edition of Indianomics. Donald Trump has stormed back to power and one of his key promises is to cut down income tax sharply and fund the budget with higher tariffs. Trump's victory sent Asian currencies from the renminbi to yen to baht hurtling down by one and a half to 2.2 percentage points this week. So, what's in store for Asia and for the Indian economy? I will be speaking to two economists who specialize on Asia, India and China. First up, let me invite Ishwar Prasad, Professor of International Trade Policy at Cornell University. Well, in a bit, uh, we will be speaking to Jahangir Aziz, the emerging market uh, economist uh, from JP Morgan. But first, let me welcome Dr. Prasad. Uh, sir, thank you very much for finding time for us. Uh, well, let me start by asking you, uh, should we expect, like one year from now, 12 months from today, uh, do you think there could be a lot of chaos in uh, the international trade with tariffs and counter tariffs? Chaos is certainly the phrase of the hour, um, Lata. There is going to be a lot of unpredictability in U.S. Um, policy making. One question is whether many of the campaign promises that uh, Trump made over the last uh, year or so are going to be translated into policy actions or if these are to be seen as threats um, that essentially bring other countries to the table and um, play um, the way Donald Trump uh, wants them to play. He certainly made um, a strong commitment to increase tariffs across the board and especially uh, to increase tariffs to a very high level um, against China. Now, I suspect we will see at least some movement on tariffs. Now, whether he is going to raise them to the extent he's talked about, whether these are going to be across the board remains to be seen. But it certainly creates a lot of uncertainty among U.S. trading partners and for the global trading system more broadly, because um, Trump's moves, even if they don't turn out to be um, very significant tariff increases, are going to put a crimp on world trade and could lead us to a place where we have protectionist moves um, beginning to emerge around the world. Mm -hmm. uh, what's your base case in terms of a Chinese response? The market is clearly guessing that China will depreciate its currency to account for at least part of, uh, you know, the, uh, uh, the tariffs increasing prices of their products. Do you think that that will be China's uh, reply? Now, the Chinese economy is in a very difficult position now relative to uh, the previous time Trump was in office and we had uh, similar issues on the table. Right now, the Chinese economy is not doing terribly well. And over the last couple of years in the post-COVID period, uh, one of the key drivers of growth in China has been investment. Domestic demand, especially household demand, has been relatively weak. So we have a bit of an imbalance between the increase in supply and weak demand. So China has been relying on exports to a good deal to power its growth. So tariffs at a time like this that limit exports uh, to one of the key uh, export markets could be important. Now, having said that, the U.S. has become a less important export market for China over time, at least directly, although there are some exports going through Mexico and Vietnam to get around some restrictions on Chinese direct exports to the U.S. So it's not as important as it used to be, but at a time when the Chinese economy is vulnerable, this certainly is a concern. So we're going to see a series of policy responses from China. I think the currency is one that they cannot use to a great extent because there is a risk that if they do start a cycle of currency depreciation at a time when their economy is weak and confidence is weak, you could see a large surge of capital outflows that becomes very difficult to manage if that sets off a capital outflow currency depreciation spiral. But certainly a little bit of currency depreciation will help. But I think we will see a significant um, amount of stimulus um, from the Chinese government. We've already seen a number of measures to ease monetary policy, cutting interest rates, making credit more widely available. And I suspect that is going to be supplemented with a significant amount of fiscal stimulus uh, to prop up the economy. Okay. Well, let me come back to the U.S. economy and then uh, ask questions on Asia. Uh, the way the markets have, uh, you know, pushed up U.S. stocks, it is betting on very good growth in the U.S. itself, probably because of lower taxes, a higher fiscal deficit, both of which are, you know, growth stimulating. So do you think in, FI, uh, in calendar 2025 itself, growth may be good in the U.S.? Is that a, a bet to take? 
the U.S. economy has proved pretty robust over the last uh, um, few quarters, despite um, interest rates being held at um, fairly high levels until this past uh, summer, and that momentum is likely to um, continue. Uh, the U.S. is somewhat insulated from what happens in the rest of the world, so it can um, power itself along. And certainly some of the measures that um, Trump has talked about, uh, which are likely to widen the deficit, will have a short-term stimulative effect. One of the reasons I think we are seeing stock markets in particular doing so well is not just a bet on growth, but also a bet on a much looser regulatory environment, uh -huh. which could be very good for corporate earnings. So that, I think, um, is one of the reasons why, independent of what happens in terms of uh, growth, um, stock markets uh, have really um, gotten a boost from this election outcome. Now, having said that, I think the um, the fundamental strengths of the U.S. economy are likely to remain. And if we move uh, to an environment where interest rates are lower, where there is some fiscal stimulus along the pipeline, and we switch uh, to a looser regulatory environment, certainly in the short run, that is all going to be good for growth. Okay, yeah, you, you emphasize short run. And uh, I thank you for that, because that leads to the next question. In the medium term, the, the fiscal deficit is already very high. I mean ranging over 6%. Uh, we, we, we already saw that uh, bond yields, despite the Fed cutting rates by a huge 50 bips in the first short, uh, bond yields have gone up uh, like 60, 70 basis points, uh, uh, simply because of the feared supply of bonds. This looks a little contradictory to me. If the sovereign paper is going towards 4.5, uh, you know, as fiscal deficit increases, wouldn't that be anti-growth? Wouldn't that hurt growth? I think the long-term interest rates uh, um, in the U.S., especially the 10-year Treasury security, which you alluded to, mm. is certainly hinting that there are significant uh, uh, fiscal problems ahead. Um, uh, neither of the two um, uh, campaigns, uh, you know, made any pretense of trying to rein in the fiscal deficit. And certainly much of what Trump has talked about is really going to expand the deficit very significantly. And it's very hard for bond markets to ignore that, even if short term rates are coming down. We have other uh, phenomena um, in play, of course. The Fed um, has been trying to slowly um, reduce the holdings of uh, Treasury securities on its balance sheet, which is um, um, going to, again, reduce the demand for Treasuries. Now, one of the interesting questions is whether, given that we are moving to an environment where there is going to be much more volatility and unpredictability of U.S. policies, which affects the U.S. and the rest of the world, whether that is going to lead to an increased demand for safe assets. And of course, when the world looks for safety, it usually turns to U.S. Treasury securities, which could help in keeping down rates uh, at the long end of the yield curve. But it's hard to believe that with uh, U.S. deficits continuing to rise, even at a time when the economy is doing so well, um, that this will not have a significant implication on um, long-term rates. And that could certainly affect capital allocation in the economy and therefore long-term productivity and growth. But again, set against that is the fact that the U.S. Had had, has had a bit of a productivity boomlet in the last few quarters, unlike in much of the rest of the world where productivity has been weak. Um, we don't have a good sense, again, of why this is happening. You know, people have talked about um, AI and other technology-related issues boosting productivity. But whatever the cause, the U.S. has not done too badly in terms of productivity. So you could have a situation where rates, um, uh, especially at the long end, remain somewhat elevated, but still uh, the U.S. is able to generate good growth because of good productivity growth. Okay, you're giving us more reasons for U.S. exceptionalism, actually. Uh, now, let me come back to trade. Uh, do you uh, see global trade and therefore global growth getting impacted because of the impending war? Uh, if, if yes, by when do you think these reverses might hit? We are certainly moving into an era where there is going to be a much more aggressive use of uh, um, trade protectionism. Um, it's hard to imagine that the U.S. is um, going to take action just against China. You know, Trump um, has this view that any country with which the U.S. runs a trade deficit uh, needs to fix um, its trade policies and is playing um, unfair. And this is going to have broad repercussions um, around the world because if the U.S. starts um, raising tariffs, other countries are likely uh, to respond with similar measures. So we could see um, a wave of protectionism around the world. Again, what remains to be um, seen is whether the very real threat of uh, um, significant tariffs being imposed by the U.S. 
causes China, causes Europe and other trading partners of the US uh, to start taking measures to um, to basically um, you know, uh, make Trump happier, maybe with China buying more soybeans, agreeing to accept uh, more goods from the US, agreeing to um, make its markets more open and so on. So we could see implications, not just for trade policy, but across a broad range of policies. But for private businesses, which are really the key drivers of uh, global integration, this is an, uh, a period of elevated risks, geopolitical risks, risks of protectionism. So I think we are going to see a response in terms of you know channeling uh, trade and investment flows towards countries that are more geopolitically aligned with each other. Um, so for US investments, this might mean less money in China, perhaps more money coming towards India and other uh, and um, uh, many advanced Western economies, while China um, tries to look for export markets in the rest of the world. So we are definitely going to see a rejiggering of trade and investment patterns. Um, this may not necessarily mean a substantial decline in global trade and investment flows, mm. but certainly a reorientation is in prospect. Okay, that looks like uh, India could be the beneficiary. But, uh, you know, there is uh, another uh, point of view that keeps coming from the market that uh, Trump in the past has tried to shout down the Fed into cutting rates or shout down trading partners and try, trying to keep the dollar from becoming too strong. You think the US can get away with that? Keeping yields low simply because uh, the president uh, wants it or demands it? Or do you think that has its limits? There is certainly a limit to what a uh, president can do, but this uh, particular president is certainly going to take a much more aggressive approach uh, um, to what he thinks is right for the um, economy. Now, um, he's talked actually about um, uh, weakening the dollar so that um, other countries don't have a competitive advantage uh, that results from a strong dollar when their currencies are weak. Um, but interestingly, if he did move forward with tariffs, that is certainly going to have... Uh, um, an impact in terms of reducing the U.S. trade deficit and all will almost certainly lead to an increase in the value of the dollar, which is probably not what he wants. Mm. The Fed is another um, issue altogether. I think there is a real concern um, that Trump could appoint people uh, to the Fed who are seen as working at his bidding. Now, the Fed's independence has been really crucial um, for its effectiveness, for its credibility and legitimacy. Um, and if we move to an era where the Fed is seen as taking orders um, from um, the political masters, especially from the White House. Um, in the short run, that may not have a huge effect, but in uh, times of peril, when the Fed's credibility really becomes um, the only thing standing be uh, between you know, a financial market disaster and stability, that could become a real problem. So you spoke about long-term issues. That is one I really worry about, the erosion of the Fed's independence and credibility. That's a serious one. Uh, uh, Dr. Prasad, uh, we, we have to wind up. But uh, can you tell us, uh, you know, what is, uh, what is in it for India? At the end of it, do you think uh, we are going to see a continually depreciating currency because we have to compete with a Chinese depreciation? Uh, will we be beneficiaries of this uh, uh, lightly impending trade war? Uh, just your word, your last word on India. I hope that there will be opportunity for India amid all this chaos and uh, turmoil. Certainly, India is seen uh, as a country much more aligned with the U.S. in terms of economic and geopolitical interests. Um, so there is certainly an opportunity, but it will take um, some very careful nurturing of the relationship between Modi and Trump, who seem to have hit it off uh, during his previous term. So I hope that that can continue and that India can benefit from more trade and investment coming towards it. One more. There is a, uh, you know... Trump is seen as a war dove, even if he's a tariff hawk. Uh, the expectation somehow in the markets is that he will be able to put out all the fires. Uh, would you think that therefore we are in for at least lower crude prices uh, uh, because he will settle the Ukraine war probably one way or the other, as well as the Red Sea problem? Now, certainly, I think we are in an era where uh, Trump has very specific views about how those um, um, geopolitical conflicts need to be settled. And it's certainly um, not um, uh, necessarily the best outcomes for the world, but uh, we could certainly see some pressure uh, from him on the relevant parties uh, to put out those fires as you, uh, as you describe them. And that is 
at some level going to lead to a little more peace around the world, um, but at a cost in terms of volatility of policies. But that could certainly take some edge of uh, crude oil and energy prices more broadly, especially if the U.S. also goes ahead with substantially increasing energy production here. Okay, we'll have to leave it at that because we are out of time, but there are so many subtopics over here and we will pull them later uh, at a later date. Thank you very much indeed for joining us, Dr. Prasad. It was my pleasure, Lata. Thank you. So the key takeaways, we may actually see good U.S. growth, especially given the recent productivity increases in that country. The, uh, the uh, increase in, uh, uh, you know, fiscal, uh, uh, the re reduction of taxes, increase in fiscal deficit can actually be growth supportive. And Dr. Prasad doesn't think that overall volume of trade needs to fall globally. It may only get uh, rerouted. The big worry is that the Fed's independence could be challenged. Uh, we have to take a break on that note. After that, we're going to come back with another economist, J.P. Morgan's Jahangir Aziz, to continue with this discussion.